as often happens in Australian settings, uh, the book is widely uh, known in the United States and Europe, but really got very little coverage here, but that's why it goes. Um, so there are two, I've always said that there are two main qualifications that I've got for my work. One is my uh, academic qualifications, including the PhD from ANU. And the other one uh, is the perspectives and, and grounding that comes from being gay. And in many uh, senses, that was the most important qualification I've uh, got. Uh, and we may see some of that uh, just coming into the work. So next slide, please. So while it may not be obvious, history lies at the heart of uh, my academic and intellectual life. This includes the history of medicine and public health, uh, the histories of colonialism and marginalization, uh, LGBTQAI histories and histories, and my own personal story, which is a, for me a very important driving history that set my career path. Yet history fades and periodically it needs refreshing. Indeed, there are some people in this world who want it to fade because they're wishing to rewrite it in their own, into their own narrative and in their own image. And it upsets me frequently when I see universities deprecating the arts and the humanities. Uh, and in the sciences, I've often reminded colleagues that, uh, uh, that the prerequisite for great scientific research is enormous creativity and a great imagination. You've got to imagine an alternative to the dogma and the status quo that we know now. So it's a pity that uh, arts and humanities are being deprecated and also that they're quarantined to a particular part of the university and we could all benefit from working with them. With those comments in mind, today I want to revisit and refresh a little history and start by turning a fresh eye uh, to some not so new data, which seems to have relevance in this pandemic age. Uh, the next slide, please, Frida. So we're going to revisit HIV in Australia. I've got the reference on the PowerPoint there in case, for most of this work, in case you want to follow up or I can send you a copy of the paper. Next slide, please. There is an untruth that like, there is an un truth that lies at the heart of the dominant narratives about the Australian successes in controlling the HIV AIDS pandemic. In essence, the, the dominant narrative goes, HIV was rapidly brought under control uh, because of the timely and enlightened approach taken by the federal government, uh, personified by the then health minister, Neil Blewett, implemented by the federal health department and best symbolized by the so-called Grim Reaper advertising campaign. However, with respect, I want to propose that this narrative is an example of history being rewritten by the powerful. And today we'll explore an alternative, in my opinion, more credible explanation. So forgive me while I first look at some fairly dry data before we get into the more exciting stuff. What you see on the screen now is a graph of the incidence of HIV in Australia. Uh, from 1980 to 1993, which is when this study uh, came to an end. What you'll see is that uh, along the bottom line uh, is that HIV appears to have arrived in Australia in 1980. Uh, then in the next four years, rapidly escalated uh, so that by 1984, it peaked. And then from the next four years, there was an almost as striking drop off in HIV new infections. And then the following years, it remained at relatively low to the point where now we're talking about the possibility of eliminating HIV from Australia. What I want to look at is the rise and the fall in the first eight years, because they are, that is a remarkable public health outcome and we need to understand it better. So for future pandemics, uh, we might have some clues. I have, the method we took was we interviewed key stakeholders and we went through the uh, press at the time, this was pre-internet, uh, and we identified all of the key activities in the non-government sector and the government sector 
uh, that might have had an impact uh, on the new numbers of new cases of HIV. Next slide, please. On this slide, against a timeline, I've put the key activities in the non-government sector, including the first media report of HIV, including the first AIDS case, including the first AIDS Action Committee uh, and the first death, uh, followed by uh, the uh, ANZAS conference uh, and the first AIDS Council, and then finally the founding of AFAO. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, I've added in underneath all of the key government formative activities, setting up national councils, uh, uh, offering testing, uh, and setting up the subsidy for anti introduction of antiretrovirals. The black line running um, diagonally across the screen is federal government funding for AIDS prevention. The point here is that uh, firstly, visually, you can see that a lot of the non-government sectors activities, establishment activities occurred uh, generally earlier than the government uh, based activities. And that much of the decline in HIV uh, incidents, new cases, uh, occurred before funding levels have risen to their high levels that they eventually became. You'll see that that decline in HIV uh, occurred well before the government introduced the first national strategy, which you can, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you can see in 19, uh, what is it, 89. You can see that it occurred well before the introduction of antivirals in late 1987. You can see it occurred well before the Grim Reaper campaign and before the famous Ottawa Charter uh, or the uh, Global Programme on AIDS uh, 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 or even, and uh, it occurred, uh, universal blood bank testing occurred in the middle of that drop. So what's the point? Well, we can't actually conclude that any of those uh, uh, points on the graph cause the decline because this is a decline that was nationwide and it would be very difficult to design a study that could actually demonstrate that any one factor caused a decline. But what we can do is we can say certain things did not make a difference. For example, the Grim Reaper campaign made no difference to the decline in HIV in Australia. The inter introduction of antiretrovirus did not influence that huge decline between 1984 and 1988 because it came at the end of that decline. Uh, uh, so, and the first national strategy happened a couple of years after that decline has already come down. So none of those major government activities could have produced the decline that we see. The question then becomes, what might have contributed to decline? When you think about it, what has to be done is sexual behavior has to change and also drug using behavior. Uh, but the, drug, the epidemic of HIV in injecting drug users in Australia is a slightly different story in that it was a, an epidemic that didn't skyrocket like uh, the epidemic amongst gay men did. Uh, and so, uh, it's really an epidemic, that story is an epidemic that failed to materialise at huge levels, whereas uh, the sexual transmission of HIV amongst gay men uh, rapidly escalated and rapidly declined. So clearly the change had to be particularly amongst gay men in the, in the early 1980s in Australia. And that happens to coincide with some of the earlier activities or suggestions that the, the community sector had become active in this area. So uh, the argument of the paper, if you want to follow up further, is actually many of the things that are attributed to the federal government did not, cannot explain why HIV dropped 
And it looks likely from all of the other data that it was community mobilization at the grassroots, because when you think about it, that's what's necessary for sexual practices in those private bedrooms around the country, in private uh, uh, liaisons between consenting adults, for sexual practices to change, it has to be taken on board by the community and incorporated into the culture of the community. So clearly it wasn't the health department or the health minister that was able to do that. It had to be the community itself. Next slide, please. I'm, as I said, history is very important. So this slide is a slight diversion, but it's to show something. That HIV arrived here when only ACT and South Australia had decriminalised homosexuality. When it arrived, all other states and territories, homosexuality is still criminalised. And this uh, meant that uh, people could be sent to jail. And in fact, I had friends who were sent to jail after being caused in, uh, caught in sexual acts. Uh, and uh, that... Uh, the other complication is that health promotion uh, and being sex positive in that climate was made much more difficult because you always had to keep an eye on uh, what the police were doing. Uh, so uh, next uh, slide, please. So let's go back further and look at the historical context. Uh, the fact that uh, homosexual or sodomy was illegal in Australia, uh, even when HIV, in most parts of Australia, when HIV arrived, has a long historical story. And it explains that even after decriminalization happened, uh, destigmatization did not happen. And that was a much slower process that also uh, greatly affected uh, uh, HIV, our capacity to control HIV. Uh, in effect, what we had to do, many of the early workers, including myself, we had to break the law in order to implement uh, HIV prevention strategies. In Melbourne in the early 1980s, we started giving out fresh needles and syringes to people, even though it was illegal. And we started giving out condoms and uh, promoting, basically promoting safe sex, which meant promoting gay sex at the same time. Uh, so there were also many other small problems we came across. I was working at Fairfield Hospital in Melbourne at that stage, which was a major AIDS hospital in Victoria. Uh, and we had nurses not allowing lovers to see their dying partner because they weren't blood relatives. We had doctors, uh, in fact, one doctor told me that I shouldn't be involved in HIV because I was gay, I had a conflict of interest as if to say uh, women shouldn't be involved in women's health because that's a fundamental conflict of interest or people who like children shouldn't be involved in pediatric research because that's a conflict of interest. So there was deep prejudice, but these prejudices made sense to people at the time. There was also numerous stories of uh, families excluding uh, long-term partners from funerals and uh, contesting or being denied access to wills and inheritance lovers. Uh, I was a member of the National Centre Board of Management for the National Centre for HIV Virology Research. That centre uh, had regular scientific conferences and every, every member of the board was asked to uh, chair one of those sessions at the conference, except for me, even though I was a qualified medical practitioner and qualified in the laboratories at Fairfield Hospital, I was never asked. Um, and that's because I didn't represent the medical interests. I was there representing the interests of the community. Uh, the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation set up the Centre for STI, STI Research at La Trobe University. You now know of that centre as being ARCHES, or Australian Research Centre on Sex, Health and Society. A colleague of mine was on the board that made that, uh, 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 that awarded that grant to set up that centre. Uh, and I got feedback later about what happened on that board. Uh, for a start, we put in an, a successful bid that went to international review. Uh, 
uh, and the bid was rejected and they retendered. We put in the second bid after the retendering and uh, uh, on that second bid, we were successful once more. Uh, the colleague of mine said he was in the board meeting when uh, the discussion happened about awarding the tender because they really couldn't retender it for a third time. And a large part of the discussion is we must not let the gay lobby get hold of this centre. Um, so there was a, a deep uh, cultural backdrop. Uh, unlike what the media is saying, Neil Blewett and the, uh, at the TGA were not particularly popular because they were slowing down access to treatments, life-saving treatments. And in fact, there were protests held by ACT UP against the health minister and the health department because of their sluggishness of their response. Those things tend not to be on the historical record uh, because as I said, it's the uh, powerful that write the histories in this world. Next slide, please. So I want to go way back now and see that in the Western cultures, there's a long tradition of prejudice against all of the groups that were particularly vulnerable to HIV. There's numerous factual accounts of burning of uh, faggots at, a, at, a, at the stake. Uh, faggots, of course, were bundles of wood that you put on a fire to light a fire. And uh, one theory is that's why gay men in the United States are called faggots. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there were formal executions uh, uh, in most British Empire countries. Uh, this is one in London in 18, I think it's 1839 of Captain Henry Nichols. So all of these executions for sodomy are uh, on the public record, <coughs> pardon me, and uh, are uh, fully documented. Uh, the last British territory on earth to execute a so-called sodomite was Tasmania, uh, which was, I think, in 1869. Uh, and next slide, please. But uh, during World War II, that wasn't the end of the story when executions were stopped. In fact, the last state in Australia to, de to remove the death penalty for sodomy was Victoria, and that was in 1949. Uh, during the Second World War, shortly before that, uh, homosexuals were, particularly male homosexuals, were rounded up um, and put into the death camps alongside the Jews, the antisocials, the Seventh-day Adventists and various other groups. Uh, and Sachsenhausen camp, just outside of Berlin, was known be to be a place where homosexuals were sent during the World War II. And there are uh, uh, numerous first-hand accounts of people who were in that camp, many of, uh, some of whom survived and many of whom died. Uh, this, this quarry specialised in the production of cement for the war effort. Uh, next slide, please. The Nazis were also known to do castration experiments uh, in, order to, in, in an attempt to cure homosexuality because they believed it was a glandular problem. Um, in fact, prior to the war, uh, these sorts of activities had already been started by the medical profession in Germany. And in fact, psychiatric hospitals were setting up gas chambers to, <coughs> to uh, eliminate the unfit before the war even started. Uh, so psychiatrists played an active and extremely unhelpful role in the way the war evolved, presumably under pressure from the Nazi party, but nevertheless, it was before the war started. Next slide, please. On the uniform of people in those death camps in Germany, the gay, gay men in the death camps, instead of the Star of David, which was sewn on the uh, uniforms of Jewish internees, homosexual internees, they sewed the pink triangle. And accounts from the camp showed that the pink triangle was often larger than the other uh, symbols uh, so that people could see it from a further distance and stay clear of the homosexuals. 
So in the early 1980s, ACT UP adopted silence equals death and the pink triangle to link the inaction of governments around the world during the, in the 1980s against this deadly disease and the atrocities that happened in Germany in uh, World War II. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the newspapers had a field day and we'll see a bit more of this. So not all uh, 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 prejudice during, those, during the 1980s was due to uh, omissions. Some of it was commissions. There was a lot of, including medical people, who spoke out against the role of uh, gay people in the epidemic. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, three pages from the Sydney Star Observer, the Sydney Gay newspaper, that I lifted on the 23rd of March 1995. Uh, keep in mind that that was when I was doing my PhD. And the newspapers were full of uh, accounts of homophobic attacks, murders, uh, plus the third page is, the, is uh, death advertisements. Pardon me, but... It's uh, hard to talk about this. Next slide, please. Women were also not immune to this, and this too has a long history. Uh, there's a not so proud tradition of executing uh, non -conf gender conforming women and non conforming women uh, as uh, for being witches. And so this is a woodblock of the three Jones, Jones Prentice, Upney and Cunny, executed in 1589. But there were many, many, many examples of this, both in the United States and in Europe and other parts of the world. And in some parts of the world, it's still happening. Uh, often they were said to be associated with devil's familiars. So you can see the little animals down below, including one that looks like it's sodomizing another one. And they're called Jack and Jill, and they're going up the hill because on top of the hill was the gallows. Next slide, please. The Grim Reaper came into these, uh, this, this story back in those days as well. And so what you've got here is a poor, naive, innocent young man. who All he wants to do is get married and have a white picket fence. And this evil woman behind a mask who is going to uh, uh, lead to his demise, presumably by giving him syphilis, as if it was the woman's fault. Next page, please. And so the Grim Reaper archetype came into the culture during that time. And so here we have a woman of the night, uh, a prostitute uh, with the, the sickle behind her. Next slide, please. And here we have the Australian AIDS education campaign, the Grim Reaper campaign, during uh, I think it was about 1988 or so, uh, where if we go back to the previous slide, if that's possible, you can see it's almost identical iconography there. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, venereal disease was uh, dreaded and here we have during World War II, not only was Adolf Hitler and Emperor Hirohito of Japan an enemy of the safe state, but so was syphilis, and she was the worst of the three. So this is a warning to the troops. Uh, and there's a very interesting history of an Australian-born woman who spent most of her life in New Zealand called Etty Rout, who uh, battled against venereal disease among the troops overseas. Next slide, please. Here we have sex exposure without prophylaxis is a help to the axis. So the axis of evil, which here is between Hirohito, Hitler and Mussolini, uh, is not a new idea. Uh, it wasn't invented by Ronald Reagan or modern presidents, not that he was very modern. Uh, and that notice that prophylaxis prevents venereal disease. So condoms were used in those times to prevent, prevent venereal disease. But when I, soon after I graduated, they'd only just stopped 
using urethral irrigation on men with antiseptic, which meant they put a tube up the penis and irrigated antiseptic to try and get the gonorrhea out. So it was pretty primitive. Next slide, please. And here we can see San Diego Tribune, 1987. Again, all of that iconography is there. The Grim Reaper, the, the uh, sex workers and uh, linking it to HIV. Next slide, please. And here we have uh, from Pravda, 1986. Of course, the Cyrillic script on the label in the test tube is CEDA. Uh, 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 no, is it? Anyway, it's it, CPYED, which is AIDS. And so clearly Pravda is, if you look at the virus in the test tube, it's a little swastikas. So clearly uh, the Russians thought the American were spreading Nazism back in those days too. It seems quite timely for the, at the moment. Next slide, please. But it wasn't confined to extreme right wing or extreme left wing regimes. The liberal West had a, a bad history of similar sorts of things. Uh, and racism was also integral to uh, many of the stigmas and difficulties surrounding HIV. This is a Kansas State Fair 1920, uh, where most English speaking countries and many non English speaking countries set up by the Europeans had eugenic societies. And we'll talk about the Australian Eugenic Society uh, in a few slides down the track. But this is the eugenics building in. Uh, in uh, one of the United States agricultural fairs and breeding of humans was often seen as similar to breeding cattle. Uh, and this was also something that happened during slavery in the United States and the West Indies where I used to work. Uh, here we have the, a prize winning family awarded by doctors and nurses and given sanction by the health authorities for being genetically best, but I'm not sure which they are because they all look a bit, oh no. Anyway, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a American Eugenics Society display at, in Philadelphia, 1926. If you look at the uh, poster on the right-hand side, it's all about the inheritance of color by crossing black guinea pigs with white guinea pigs. And so you can see still that color and race were fundamental to eugenic societies. Now, what's interesting is that there were many eugenicists in Australia and New Zealand and other parts of the British Commonwealth, and it was seen as a, as a positive thing. It was about the betterment of the human race is what people said, and the elimination of uh, those people that were not, were imperfect. Unfortunately, uh, when you give it that positive spin that it's about improving the entire human race, it still means that you have to determine that who is worthy of elimination. And so that's where the prejudice is concealed. And many, incidentally, many feminists of the time were eugenicists and they didn't seem to understand the inconsistency there. Next uh, uh, slide, please. There was the famous Tuskegee syphilis study, which ran between 1932 and 1972, where black sharecroppers in the southern United States who had syphilis uh, were studied. Uh, and it was started in 1932, but before penicillin was introduced, to try and understand better the, uh, the uh, natural history of syphilis. And many of the facts about syphilis we know now come, came from that study. The problem with it is that in 1945, penicillin was introduced and penicillin has never been known to not be able to cure syphilis. But these people in this study were not offered penicillin all the way till 1972 when somebody tweeted that this was extremely unethical. And that uh, Tuskegee study form the basis of many of the ethics committees that we have in universities today. Uh, next slide, please. In Australia, we, had, we didn't have the Eugenic Society in New South Wales, it was called the Racial Hygiene Association. And th their job was to promote uh, sex education. But just the mere name of racial hygiene uh, carries connotations that today we would find completely unacceptable. Next slide, please. 
And here we have another advertisement about giving people knowledge and safety uh, put out by the uh, Racial Hygiene Association. The Racial, the Racial Hygiene Association, by the way, now is called the Family Planning Association. Next slide, please. So community mobilization is the next thing I want to look at. You have to tell me if I'm running out of time. Uh, and we'll go through that fairly quickly. Community mobilization, the, th the thesis behind this paper is the reason why HIV dropped so quickly is that the community mobilized. So let's have a look at some examples of what was going on around there. Next slide, please. There were basically the five H's of HIV. Uh, and these came up before we had identified the uh, virus and people were thinking it was exposure to poppers and other drugs and ex excessive exposure to anally to, the, to semen and all sorts of other uh, crazy theories. But then the virus was discovered, I think, in 1983 uh, by Luke Montagna, who recently died. Um, and uh, there were five H's. Homosexuals, heroin users, hookers, Haitians, and hemophiliacs. So take your choice. You could uh, find prejudice against any one of those groups. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's have a look at some of the community mobilization. Some of this was funded generously by the Commonwealth. I don't want to say it suggests that the Commonwealth did nothing, but they were late to the party, is the point. So these are targeting. Uh, Aboriginal people, particularly uh, the condom man started in Northern Australia and Torres Strait, so Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, and I know from work I've done in Papua New Guinea that, uh, that phantom comics are very popular in those countries. So it was an attempt to tap into culturally important figures, um, uh, including the colors and, and to the, uh, the language. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, colleagues, including myself, uh, we got together and developed a uh, partnership with Aboriginal Medical Service at Katungal down on the south coast, uh, where we ran joint workshops for young Aboriginal people to try and help to uh, uh, spread knowledge about sexual safety and to uh, encourage uh, uh, better management of HIV. Uh, this was triggered Auntie Pat on the left. Um, uh, her son died of AIDS. Uh, and of course, she's given us permission to uh, talk about her experiences. And that's exactly what she's doing in this picture. She's telling everybody about her son and everything he went through. There are many, of course, not surprisingly, gay and lesbian Aboriginal people uh, who also uh, participated in these uh, events and this uh, partnership proved so successful in the end uh, it was run right across New South Wales and we delivered joint workshops with local partners all the way from Redfern to Wilcannia and Broken Hill. Uh, next slide please. Here are some of our uh, other partners on the south coast. Next slide please. Uh, similar things happened in Papua New Guinea. So this is in Milne Bay province where we're watching a demonstration of somebody putting a condom on a finger uh, to demonstrate how to use condoms on the penis. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a STD clinic in Rabaul where the nurse did uh, really good outreach to sex workers around uh, the New Britain area. Uh, Interestingly enough, the condom demonstrations always stopped when the local priest walked by and after he was away out of sight, uh, they started again. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there were culturally appropriate materials developed linking the danger of AIDS to the danger of sharks in this case. Uh, this is in Pigeon from Vanuatu. Next slide, please. Uh, some weren't so culturally appropriate. So this is, I did a fact-finding tour of Africa with Ita Butros to try and learn more about what was happening with AIDS here. And I collected this uh, poster in Kenya. And things like homosexuality is an abnormal human behaviour. It should be avoided and discouraged is one of the pieces of advice in this, uh, uh, in this poster where many people uh, don't have good literacy. Next slide, please. 
Similar things in the United States in the attempts to link it with celebrity. Some of the messages might have been things that we would not be comfortable with now, like keep it clean, associating uh, getting HIV with being dirty, or don't play with strangers, kind of playing up that stranger danger as if it's safe if you're with somebody uh, you know. Next slide, please. The West Australian AIDS Council ran a competition for design students and selected the best uh, submissions to produce posters out of. So there was community engagement through those sorts of activities. Next slide, please. And humour was attempted. This was put out by the uh, AIDS Council of New South Wales. Next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, Although it doesn't look like me, one of those people there is me, the rest of the people are deaf. Uh, we did outreach to, we installed in the STD clinic in Melbourne a TTY service because deaf people couldn't ring in and we were seeing more and more deaf people getting HIV. Uh, and we got the community, the gay deaf men together, all of these other people are gay deaf men, got together to promote uh, safe sex amongst the deaf community with familiar faces. And in fact, we're spelling out safe sex is good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a paranoia almost of bisexuality. And of course, again, the stereotypical images of the naive innocent woman and uh, bad things happening behind her back came out in some of the posters that were produced. Uh, uh, this was from New South Wales, I believe. Uh, next slide, please. We had to try and eroticize safe sex and we had to say be sex positive. And so the left hand picture was produced by the Victorian AIDS Council. And it wasn't saying don't have sex. It was saying when you have sex, make it safe. And of course, that drew huge uh, objections of young people kissing from the church groups, needless to say. Uh, and the poster on the right, I think, is from the ACT. Uh, and I think Jeanette Baldwin and other people in Peter Rowland's uh, interchange general practice, which was up at the uh, bus, the civic bus stop at that stage, they ran workshops on trying to eroticize safe sex in conjunction with AIDS action of the ACT. Uh, so being sex positive was extremely important. Preserving people's sexual identity and sexual life was part of what we believed was the right way to go but making it safe through a united community movement. Next slide, please. And to, we had to address the fact that for many people, AIDS was a surrogate marker for homosexuality. Uh, and in Australia, it wasn't so untrue, but uh, nevertheless, homosexuality was a, a surrogate marker for being less of a man. And so we had to, all around the world, we had to try and make safe, being safe seem manly. Next slide, please. And trying to eroticize it and make humor. So it had to be very specific. We did a campaign in Melbourne around all the beats where we actually put stickers in the urinals because we knew and sl slash the stickers with messages on them with a razor blade so that when people went in there they couldn't pull them off and they wouldn't want to touch the urinals anyway. We had to do many devious things just to get the messages out there in front of people at the right time. Next slide please. It had to be a community effort, we had to be condom wise and it's no accident that everybody is heading the same direction because it was a very united response in the 1980s. There was only one rule, whether a test is positive or negative, or you've never been tested before, you've still got to be safe. You don't want to pass it on, you don't want to pick it up, and if you don't know, just keep it to yourself, basically, or don't get infected. So it was very possible back then for everybody to have one rule, and we leveraged that very strongly with community development strategies. Next slide, please. And so here we are. Safety is more than sex. It's basically saying it's about a strong community. Next slide, please. I think uh, we're, I'm running out of time. Um, I have, I, I want to talk a little bit about protest. Can I go over time a little bit? Can we skip through these slides quickly uh, and go through to the next section, which says about protest. I just want to draw some 
Uh, right, here we go. Yeah, okay. Well, the uh, 75th anniversary of the Australian Navy came. Actually, go back one to that one and go back two. Uh, so, and there were some demonstrations of, because American ships were visiting, we were worried that that would introduce higher levels of HIV into Australia. So the prostitutes put out this poster. Next slide, please. And uh, the Victorian AIDS Council put out this poster, uh, trying to, it was monochrome, cheap, attractive, targeted, all that sort of stuff. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at some of the protests so we can draw some parallels with COVID. Next slide. Thanks. So here we have the silence equals death. There was many protests and ACT UP protested. So like COVID, there were protests. But if you look at the analysis, you'll see that they were very different. Next slide, please. Flinders Street Station. Next slide, please. Uh, arrests by New South Wales Police. Next slide, please. Of ACT UP members. And here's one of the key differences with uh, 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 many of the protests we've had in Canberra just recently, where people were protesting against medical technology and vaccines. Here, the protests were saying, get the drugs out, get the research done, we're dying. Next slide, please. And ACT UP in the United States publicized this really loudly. Next slide, please, 55,000. It blamed the government because there was one death in every half hour back in 1989. Next slide, please. President Reagan didn't mention HIV once in his entire term, and I don't think Bob Hawke did either, although other, help, other ministers did. Next slide, please. I think that speaks for itself. Next slide, please. One in 61 babies were born in New York HIV positive. 25% of prisoners in New York prisons were born with HIV, oh, sorry, not born, were, had HIV, tested with HIV. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the FDA and the health authorities were targeted for, for, for their punitive and slow approach. Next slide, please. Big business and news reporting was targeted. Next slide, please. The church was targeted. Next slide, please. And sexism was targeted. Uh, next slide, please. So contrast with HIV and then I'll end very quickly. HIV, uh, sorry, with COVID. Next slide, please. Here we had a pandemic run by press conference by Older white men, I'm not allowed to say that because I've <laughs> it makes me a hypocrite now. But anyway, next slide, please. Uh, there were special risk groups. So on the right is St Basil's home in Melbourne and on the left is a locked down high rise building. Um, Housing Commission, next slide, please. It was a very uh, law and military based approach. Next slide, please. And the protesters, were a very unusual coalition, really. Uh, Anti-vaxxers, uh, conspiracy theorists. Uh, you've, you've seen it all going through. Next slide, please. Uh, religious groups. And what I found quite interesting is they're also in those crowds. It's a bit hard to see there. There were rainbow people. So um, uh, bottom left, there's two rainbows, one on the, a woman's top, I think, and also the poster on the right hand of that bottom left is a rainbow. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll end there. I think uh, I've gone over, well and truly over time. So uh, I think we're, Ali, I think we're open for questions. Hello, Dave, and hello, everyone. We are open for questions. Um, so I've got two submitted questions and I will start with those. Um, and I know that um, we will wrap up shortly, but not before these awesome questions. Uh, one attendee has asked you, what was your ANU experience like being part of the LGBT community uh, in the 90s? So what was your experience at ANU at that time? Uh, that's a good question. It was an interesting thing. Um, I, I give a huge credit to ANU because in fact, I, uh, and to NSEF, because I 
put in a proposal to study homophobia uh, for my PhD uh, because I wanted to use it as a case study for the social determinants of health. Uh, and uh, NCEF was very enthusiastic and welcomed me. Not everybody in NCEF, but the director was, and my supervisors were very good. And uh, so I'm very grateful to that. But there were um, a, a, a lot of attitudes that kind of didn't quite add up. The director, who was very supportive of me getting in, Always, if he brought guests around, he would always introduce me as somebody who was studying homosexuality. And in fact, I wasn't. I was studying homophobia. And in fact, the last people I want to look at directly or accuse of homophobia as homosexuals, I was actually looking at wider society and the, the perpetrators of homophobia and why on earth they felt it was so important. So uh, uh, there was that slippage that if you're studying homophobia, you must be studying homosexuality. Um, so, uh, there also, I found it very necessary to get deeply immersed in qualitative research uh, in order to understand the reasons why, not just uh, the statistics. And that met with a whole heap of uh, uh, inappropriate responses. And I always made the point that one of the greatest pieces of research in biomedical sciences was Charles Darwin and he was a qualitative researcher and he changed the world and we can too. Okay. All right, and we've got one more question. Uh, could you let us know what was the most interesting homophobic pro propaganda that uh, you received while doing your PhD or that you were aware of? Uh, I, the, the homophobic propaganda, people knowing that I was studying homophobia tended to uh, not rub that sort of thing in my face. Uh, so I didn't see that much of it. And being in Canberra is a sort of a privileged space. Uh, I came across a lot of homophobia, a huge amount of homophobia during my time as president of the AIDS Federation, uh, including from officials. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I got letters, threatening letters from for example, dentists in Wagga, uh, you know, and all sorts of things. So there was a huge amount of homophobia during that period. But my time at ANU was uh, not that bad. Uh, it was characterised more by a lack of understanding than hostility. Okay, and I've got another question. What is the most positive change you've seen um, over the years in relation to your research? And I guess... Um, uh, or gay rights generally? Um, I should say that maybe I need to explain uh, the research a little and then talk about gay rights generally. Uh, the research found, and I haven't talked about this at all, that's another whole seminar or 10, uh, that in fact, most homophobic words were uh, people were exposed to homophobic words at primary school in Australia before they'd reached puberty, before they'd developed their own sexual identity, before they'd, uh, you know, ever had sex in most cases. Uh, and yet they had already heard uh, these words. And I said, well, what did they mean? And I was told, oh, they didn't mean anything. Uh, and in fact, when you dig deeper with that, actually they were deeply meaningful. They were never positive. You never called a girl a pufta. It was a highly gendered term. Uh, and it was never a positive term. It was very negative. In fact, I asked young people to, that I interviewed to rank them. And they said, the thing I'd, uh, I'd say, tell me all the swear words you heard at school. Now tell me which was the one you'd least like to be called. And usually the whole homophobic terms were at the top of the list. Uh, and uh, so uh, what that told me was, in fact, homophobia is driven by something that predates homosexuality. In fact, it's gender and it's, it's people who don't, aren't considered to be manly enough. It might be the colour of their jumper or the wool that their jumper is made from or the fact that their hair is too neat or their shoes are too shiny or they're too 
for want of a better word, uh, um, meticulous uh, and uh, so on, that's where the homophobia really bites. And so kids knowing that intense negativity with a gender basis, which is why homophobia crosses into a whole range of LGBTI issues, it shouldn't be called homophobia actually. I use it as a placeholder for something else, uh, which I explain in that book. But, uh, but it extends right across. And it's why when we grow into our gay identity, our starting point is extreme negativity. And that's a problem. So what's happened? The less we have become less homophobic, we now have gay marriage. I married my husband a couple of years ago uh, after being together for 33 years. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so a lot of things have changed, but uh, I think there's a couple of things. Firstly, I don't think primary schools and secondary schools have changed as much as we would like them. I think the school ground is still a jungle. I think we adults, the worst mistake we do is we fail to intervene when we hear this stuff and that fails to protect the kids. So it's a, fa a failure of duty to care. But I could go on and on and on about this, um, uh, Ali, but it's really another seminar if you want another one in the future, because it's a huge topic. But that's also the reason why I went to the Caribbean and we did the Caribbean Masculinities Project, which is a very large project across multiple countries. And uh, I'm happy to talk about that, those projects at some other time. All right. Look, David, you're right. This, we could have further seminars um, from you. And uh, I'm sort There's of- lots of other people to talk to. Uh, so, well, we, we could have some more to um, sort of hint, hint, nudge, nudge to our alumni folk, but I'd just like to thank you for, for giving your time for our, this, um, this special event, and we hope to have many more um, featuring our LGBTIQA alumni. Um, it was, yeah, I've learned so much and I've got more questions, and I would hope that if anyone wants to ask David some more questions or um, we'll have some more details about David's work. Um, please email us and we'll make that information available to you. Please but, do. Um, happy, happy to help. And it was a pleasure. Thanks very much, Ali, and to the Alumnus Network. All right. I think uh, that, that's, that will be it. So uh, please have a, have a lovely evening and we shall see you hopefully soon again with our next seminar. Thanks, everyone, for coming.